In 2018, the United States, under the Trump administration, moved its Israeli embassy to Jerusalem. This was a declaration that the states seized Jerusalem as the legitimate capital of Israel. Unsurprisingly, there was huge international condemnation. Violence erupted on the Gaza border at the time, leading to 100 Palestinians being killed. Fears were expressed by many that this action could destabilize the whole Middle East. So why did the states do this? Why did they make such a provocative move when they didn't have to? The simple answer to that is that it was an election promise. The Republicans had, in effect, put it in their manifesto that this was what they were going to do. And so why was it an election promise? On the one hand, this would have appealed to the American Jewish community. There are 5.7 million Jews living in the United States. Compare that to the 6.34 million who live in the land of Israel, a huge number. And yet, actually, that's less than 2% of the US population. So whilst it might be a factor, it probably wasn't the biggest factor. The biggest factor was probably the white evangelical um, community in America that actually formed Don Donald Trump's core support base and can't be ignored uh, by Joe Biden either. 80% of white evangelicals in America supported Donald Trump in the 2017 and the 2021 elections. And many of these consider the restoration of the nation of Israel to be a fulfillment of promises, Old Testament prophecies. And so making Jerusalem the capital of Israel, they see as within God's plans and purposes and a precursor to the return of Jesus. Former Vice President Mike Pence, himself an evangelical, once suggested that God sent Trump to save Israel. One of Trump's top diplomats, Mike Pompeo, fairly recently defended Israel's control of Palestinian territory on the grounds that Israel has a biblical claim to the land. And he said, I am convinced by my reading of the Bible that this land is a rightful homeland of the Jewish people. Influential American evangelical preachers, and probably the most prominent one of these is John Hadji, talk and write a lot about the end times and advocate what, what is called Christian Zionism, the belief that actually there should be this state that eventually will become Christian. And they suggest that, even go as far as saying that people will be blessed if they support Israel because they're supporting God's plans and purposes for the world. The effect of this is it gives enormous permission to the nation state of Israel to do whatever it wants. And so behind the current devastating humanitarian disaster where innocent Jews and innocent Palestinians have been massacred over the past four weeks, there is this belief system about the nation of Israel that supports what is currently taking place, which is based on biblical understanding and interpretation, including a belief that God's purposes are being worked out through the Jewish nation of Israel. I want to spend a few minutes this morning considering what the Bible teaches about Jewish people, about Israel as a nation state, and about God's purposes for Jews. What should our attitude as Christians be towards Jews? Do we regard them as brothers and sisters? Because it says in Romans 11:29, which Bola read for us, God's call is irrevocable. Or do we see the need that they need to be won over to Christ? They need converting. And what should our attitude be to the nation state of Israel? Is the restoration of the state of Israel a fulfillment of biblical prophecy as those in the white evangelical community in America believe? Where the existence of Israel ought to be supported and defended on theological grounds, regardless as to what this means for Palestinians. I want to speak a little bit about what 
Romans 9 to 11, chapters 9 to 11, actually teach us because it's a good place to start. Because there Paul discusses God's people. He discusses Jews. And he regularly refers to them in that passage as Israel. He's not talking about the nation state there, but he's talking about the people, the Israelites. And he talks about them and God's ultimate purposes and plans for them. And I think he says, and I want to summarize what he says in those passages, I would encourage you to have a read through of them and, and bear what I say in light of, uh, of what is actually written there. But Paul, I think, teaches four things, at least four things, but four that I'll pick out. Firstly, he teaches clearly that the Jews, Israel, as he describes them, are still a people under God's special covenant. God hasn't given up on Israel. God hasn't entirely replaced the Jewish people with the church. So, so that's one thought within Christian church, is that we had the Jews then, they were God's people, but now the church is God's people. Well, that's called replacement theology, or, or a word, I wasn't very familiar with this, but supersessionism, I shouldn't have even put it down, should I? Supersessionism. But actually, that in a sense, God's finished now with the people of Israel, and it's all about the church. But actually, that's not what Paul teaches in, in Romans 9 to 11. Let's just have a look at these verses again we read earlier, verse 28 and 29. Paul writes, as far as the gospel is concerned, they, the Jewish people, are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they're loved on account of the patriarchs, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For God's gift and his call are irrevocable. In other words, it can't be withdrawn. It's remarkable that despite persecution throughout the centuries, the Jewish people have survived. They have suffered wave after wave of persecution, often at the hands of the Christian church. Jews have been routinely forced to live in ghettos, not treated as equals within the community where they've resided. They've regularly been expelled, and if we look at, at Christian Europe, uh, they have been expelled from cities and countries on a routine basis, England in 1290, France in 1306, Germany in the 1350s, Spain in 1492, Portugal in 1496, the Papal States in 1569. They were victims of the Russian pogroms in Russia at the end of the 19th century. And of course, there was the Nazi final solution, the Holocaust, where an estimated six million of the nine and a half million Jews living in Central and Eastern Europe were executed. Frederick the Great of Prussia, back in the 18th century, once asked his servant for proof of the existence of God, the servant reputedly replied immediately, the Jews, your majesty. According to the Apostle Paul, the remarkable continued existence of the Jewish race is because God's plans for his covenant people group are not over. As far as the gospel is concerned, verse 28, they are enemies for your sake, but as far as election is concerned, they're loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. And whilst we regularly and rightly talk about Christians as God's people, there is a sense in which Jewish people remain the people of the covenant and are still God's people. Secondly, Paul argues that most Jews, most of Israel, as he describes them, have missed God's salvation, the salvation that was offered through Jesus. They failed to recognize the Christ that had come to them. And so let me read from uh, chapter 10 some of his argument. He writes this. He says, not all Israelites accepted the good news. Some did, but not all. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I asked, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. He then goes on in chapter 11 to use a gardening metaphor, comparing God's people to an olive tree, and he describes how we, as non-Jews, and that is, I think, all of us here, Gentiles, have actually been grafted into this olive tree. The olive tree represents God's people. And many Jewish people, the branches, natural branches, have been broken off. The language indicates 
here that actually there aren't two ways of salvation, just to be clear. It isn't that you can be saved through Jesus or through being a Jew. It's actually through Jesus that everyone is saved. And, and salvation, both for Jews and for non-Jews, comes only through Jesus. But Jews that reject Jesus are outside of God's salvation. That's what Paul teaches here. But he longs for a change in that. And then he says how that change might be. Thirdly, he envisages that God's inclusion of non-Jews into his people will provoke Israel, will provoke Jews to jealousy, that they will realize that actually the blessings that they've been promised throughout the centuries will come true because, uh, sorry, have come true as they see God's blessing on the Gentiles. And they'll want a part of it. They'll see the Spirit put out and they'll look at the church and they'll want to be part of this. This is what Paul envisages in his argument. And so let me read Romans 11, verse 11 and 13 and 14. He says this, Again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? This is the Jews. Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, their sin, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel, to make the Jews envious. I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arise my own people to envy and save some of them. That was what Paul saw would happen. And he hoped that as, as the Jewish people saw the Gentiles being blessed with the blessings they'd been promised, they would want a part of it. And yet, actually, the sad history of the church is that we haven't treated the Jewish people well. Rather than help Jews to follow Jesus and to see who Jesus is and to provoke them to jealousy, the actions of the church throughout history have largely pushed Jews further away from the Christ we proclaim. Steve Maltz has written a book called The People of Many Names, and he details the abuse Jews have suffered at the hands of the Christian church. Regularly, Jews have been uh, marginalized. They've been blocked from holding positions of influence. They have been, at times in history, labeled as Christ killers and blamed for crucifying Jesus. They've been treated as second-class citizens, not to be trusted. Even after the Reformation, where the Bible was widely read and taught, Jews remained victims of the church, with Martin Luther branding them as a devilish burden and, in another place, a base whoring people. This language doesn't attract the Jews to Christ, anything but. And so called Christian Europe provided a backdrop within which the Holocaust happened and Christianity failed to protect Jews from programmatic slaughter. Not only has the church failed to witness strongly to Jewish people so as to provoke them to jealousy, but through its failure to protect Jews from those with evil intent, and even through participation itself in persecution of Jews, the church has pushed the Jews further away from Jesus. I, I want to say today, as we, we talk about these issues, God wants Christians to stand against all forms of anti-Semitism. As Christians, we do not view Jewish people as inferior or label them as Christ killers. That is dangerous language. Rather, we see them as those who, like us, are in need of the grace offered to us through Jesus Christ. Christianity is a great leveler. It doesn't say we are great or we are better. Uh, evangelism is merely one beggar offering another beggar a bit of food that we have been given. And that is where we stand, and, and we need to work and speak against all anti-Semitism. And there are people in our country at this moment who are living uh, a scared life, Jews in our country, because of the threats that they're receiving from people around them. Fourthly and finally, Paul, in his argument, he anticipates a turning of Jewish people to Christ. And what he says is that when that happens... God's kingdom will come in all its fullness. Let me read. We read these earlier. So back to the start of our reading, Romans 11, 25 to 26. Paul writes, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. 
And in this way, all Israel will be saved. His argument here is as follows. He says, many Jews will reject Jesus. That's what he's seeing around him. There is a hardening in part, which leads then to the salvation of many non-Jews. It's meant that the gospel has gone out to the whole world, and Gentiles have become Christians in big numbers. But this rejection is not forever. It is only in part until the full number of non-Jews, Gentiles, has come in, at which point the hardening will cease and many Jews will turn to Jesus. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. And by Israel, he's he's using that as a short term for God's people, Jews and non-Jews. The whole of God's people will be saved. He sees the kingdom as having finally come. Well, if you read through these chapters in chapters 9 to 11 you'll see there's no mention of land here. This is talking about people. Throughout the passage, the term Israel is shorthand for the people, for the Jewish people, not for the nation state. In fact, in the New Testament, I think there is a startling absence of any mention of the physical land of Israel being part of God's future promises. We find that there's a spiritualizing of language. So whilst there's no talk of God rebuilding the physical Jerusalem in the New Testament, the the Jerusalem that it talks about is now a spiritual Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, uh, one which comes down from from heaven, a heavenly city. And so uh, let me just um, illustrate this. In John chapter 4, Jesus, in his discussions with a Samaritan woman, he says, a time's coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain, where the Samaritans worship, nor in Jerusalem, where the Jews worship. A time is coming when true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. In the New Testament, the physical city of Jerusalem is no longer important. It's surpassed, and it becomes a metaphor for God's ultimate purposes in, in every place, all of his creation, becoming a place where God is, is present. And and thirdly, whilst the Old Testament contains many passages about the return of Jews to their land, I think the most natural way of reading those is to see the fulfillment when the exiles, after the exile has happened, and the people return back to Jerusalem. Those prophecies were written before the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. In other words, these promises were fulfilled 300 years before Jesus came. We don't find that the promises are reiterated in the New Testament. So whereas American evangelical preacher John Hadji says, God will crush any nation that tries to drive the Jewish people off this sacred soil called Israel, I want to say to you today that there's little support for this idea in the New Testament. There are good reasons why we might want to defend Israel as a nation state, and it's right to exist, but to do so on biblical grounds seems difficult to justify. What does this mean? Let me just say three things arising in the light of what Paul teaches, and particularly thinking about the current atrocities that have and are taking place in, uh, in Israel and in the land of, pa- of the Palestinians. Firstly, I-, I say again, we reject and we must reject all anti-Semitism. Paul reminds us of our place as Gentiles compared to God's covenant people, the Jews. We have been grafted into God's people by his grace and kindness, and we mustn't lord it over Jewish people. In in chapter 11, 25, he says explicitly, you must not think you are superior. We are saved by grace, not from ourselves, and we mustn't think of ourselves as superior to anyone else as Christians, but to honour and treat all other people with dignity and respect, including Jewish people, including Palestinian people. Secondly, I think we need to be very wary of those who claim we should support blindly everything that Israel does. Just because this is Israel, and just because the Jews are God's covenant people, this doesn't mean that everything that the nation state of Israel does is to be justified. And so we call for an end to the shedding of innocent blood. We call for the protection of civilians on humanitarian grounds. We call for the release of the hostages. 
and we call and we pray for peace. Thirdly and finally, we want Jews and Palestinians to find salvation in Jesus. Salvation is for all people, not only, and it is only, sorry, in and through Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for those who are caught up in this conflict, both Jewish and Palestinian Christians. According to Open Doors, I was interested to read this, but there are currently around 800 Christians, I think, who have been living up to the time of this current conflict in the Gaza Strip. Whether some have been able to get out, we don't know. 800, that was 3,000 about before Hamas came to power. Many have gone and left the country since Hamas have, have had control of the Gaza Strip. We need to pray for those 800 Christians, that, that they will be kept safe, but also that they will still be able to shine the light of Jesus in, in, in the darkness that is all around them, that they might be comforted so they can comfort others. According to the World Baptist Alliance, Baptists across Israel and the Palestinian territories request fervent, fervent prayer for peace. This includes... The Association of Baptist Churches in Israel, which has 17 Baptist churches, and the Council of Local Evangelical Churches in the Holy Land, representing 13 Baptist churches in the Palestinian territory, including one in Gaza. They ask that Christians from around the world unite in prayer for peace, demonstrating the love of Christ to all peoples. Jewish, Jewish people need Christ. Palestinians need Christ. We all need Christ. May the light, may his light be found and experienced in the midst of the current crisis. And may people find his kingdom of peace, Jewish and Palestinians alike.